Hi, I'm Frances Callier. And I'm Angela V. Shelton. And we're Frangela. You know what you need in your life? Hmm. The Final Word Podcast. Yes, you do. That's right. It is the final word on all things political and pop cultural. Where we make real news real funny. Where we inspire you so you can hashtag resist. Subscribe and get a new episode of The Final Word Podcast each week. It's the news we think you need to hear. That's right. We think you need to hear it. Okay? Yeah, it's what we say so. That's right. And because all we do is give, every Thursday you can listen to our hysterical podcast, Idiot of the Week. We round up the stupid because you know what? Somebody has to. Okay. All we do is give. Welcome to Feminist Buzzkills Live, the show that is no stranger to being heckled by a creep in a vermin trim coat from the cheap seats. I'm Liz Winstead. Our third brain, Marie, is out today, but never fear. The lovely, the talented Mojiala Waddell, who is with me every week, is with me today. Hey, Moj. Hey, I'm always here. Always here. <laughs> Coming up on today's show, Reverend Dr. Elise Salisbury of the Reproductive Justice Org Sister Reach is here to talk about reproductive justice in Tennessee. And polymath Jean Grey drops the most righteous affirmations to get us through the week. But first... Ah, but first, we can't start going until we're just like, just scream a bit about the State of the Union because, you know, there's just the Joe Biden being problematic Piece, but more to the point, the anti abortion asswipe that was just released on two charges of punching a 72 year old clinic escort in the face was the invited guest of Scott Perry. Yeah, Pennsylvania is really just giving us their best. They've really just jumped humanity. Fuck the shark. They've just jumped. Humanity. It is so messy. And I think this set a really good precedent, though. Uh, you just get talked about badly on our show for a week, and the week later, you can go to the State of the Union address. Or, you know, if I could make it not about us, you punch a 72 year old clinic escort in the face. And because you were released on the charges when it's caught on tape that you did it and you were let off on a technicality, you get invited to the State of the Union by a trash Republican insurrectionist who, you know, was one of the never McCarthy holdouts. And, you know, he's just if you don't know Scott Perry, he's kind of the sort of forever 21 version of Matt Gates and Ew. Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, kind of dollar story. He just yeah. doesn't have the charisma, but all of the hate. Yeah, that fucking guy. So that was depressing to see that that guy was invited, especially just in the wake of like just all of it. It was gross. It was fucking gross. But in better news, Liz, uh, I heard from a little birdie that you are going to be at the Daily Show next week. That's right. I am. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I know. I'm so kind excited. of excited. I have not been on the show in count of 22 years. And uh, it took a woman hosting to get me invited. Uh, so bless Sarah Silverman. So Monday night. Yeah, I'm going to be on The Daily Show. Uh, it's the first time in Daily Show history that the word abortion will be said as many times as it will be said. So I feel like I'll be making history a bunch of times. But yes. I just, you know, shout out to Sarah for having me on. And, you know, I'll drop some old school Daily Show tea about, you know, being in the room where it happened. And then I'll we'll just talk all about our work. And I'm super stoked to be back and doing it with uh, um, with my dear friend, Sarah. So excited. I think. So set your VCRs or watch it live or tell people, but you know, I'll be there. And, and uh, who knows what I'm wearing? I still have to decide. I think that's why I, I'm not going to lie. I had diarrhea all day. And I think it's because I don't know what I'm going to wear on the show. So I'm just going to let that shallowness sit there because I trust our listeners to sort of lean into that with me. Yeah, I think that we all understand not knowing what to wear and therefore having the shits. I feel like that is a common occurrence. Yeah, especially, you know, yeah, 
when it matters. So, but I'll figure it out. Hopefully I'll look good. Um, but anyway, should we kick off this fucking thing? Yeah, let's All right, let's do going. it. Let's do it. Let's bring in the intrepid Molly Gaby, AAF writer and a product of Florida. She got away. She's here as she is every week to drop the big steaming news dump. Hey, Ma, what you got? Thanks for the great intro, Buzzkills. Grab your wet wipes because this one is a double flusher. At the State of the Union, the president talked about abortion for a grand total of 51 seconds. For as little time as he spent talking about it, he sure got the abortion experience, being shouted at and harassed by a group of unhinged white people. In Florida, one in 10 teens who need an abortion are being denied by judges for reasons like personality and grades. People are now realizing how much control these judges have over teen girls. In other news, Matt Gates has nominated himself for judge. Next up, a federal judge in D.C. pointed out that forced childbirth could be considered involuntary servitude under the 13th Amendment. She said that Roe could possibly have been saved by looking there for abortion rights. I mean, come on, guys. You couldn't read the whole Constitution before you argued the case? Next time, let's just use ChatGPT as our lawyer, okay? It's got all the right answers. A Colorado Catholic hospital says women cannot get their tubes tied there unless they have cancer. And even then, you've got to use your one make-a-wish on it. And finally, some creepy ethicists suggested that pregnant people in vegetative states should be kept on life support so they could deliver their babies. She said it was like donating an organ for someone who might die, but donating a baby be for someone who prefers not to gestate. Now you can rest in peace knowing you've saved a Kardashian from stretch marks. This has been your big pile of steaming news dump. Stay stool, kids. Back to you guys. (laughs) We're going to stay stool. Molly, don't go. Don't go because we have some questions. (laughs) Mm -hmm. We are digging into this story about this um, ethicist, unquote, But what you didn't mention is that this ethicist is a woman. Yes, yes. Good point, Moji. From the twisted minds that brought you misogyny, this is internalized misogyny. Women can do it, too. You know, when they asked me if I wanted kids and I said, over my dead body, I never realized they would take it literally (laughs) and this far. So it's just really, really messy how they have just, um, they really got to dig deep to find ways to deal with it and it just proves you literally have more rights when you're dead than you do when you're brain dead and that's a mess thanks mal you're welcome see you next week so i'm going to take the story and run with it this ethicist who trolled us with the idea of a vegetative person's uterus as fetus storage well this isn't her first shit take rodeo she's also stated that compassion isn't required in healthcare, and she's proposed mechanical Artificial wounds, whatever the fuck that is. It so, like maybe it's like Gillies, you know, you like you ride the you you ride the bull. It's whatever it is, it's terrible. But brain dead baby mama sounds insane, but oddly familiar. And that's right. In 2014, Marily Cell Munez was legally dead, but the state of Texas kept her on life support for an additional month against her and her family's wishes because she happened to be 14 weeks pregnant. This dragged her whole family suffering out for an additional month while they fought it. But still, she's fucked up. So fucked up. And in case you're just like, oh, but of course, Texas, because a, of course, Texas, it's not the only state that's passed laws that override a patient's advanced directives um, just because they happen to be pregnant. About a dozen other states have similar laws that basically say, we don't care what you ask for. If you're pregnant, we make the decision. And so, yeah, it just pisses me off all the ways that uh, birthing people are literally fucked. Well, also, like, and you said it, this is people who have directives yeah. and their directives are be, would be overridden yeah. and are overridden. And that's so unbelievable to me that what does that mean for li- I don't even I don't even know where to start with this story, honestly, because like I was reading that also another ethicist We're using so the many ethicists. ethicists wrong you know what i mean these don't sound ethical at all no but there was an ethicist who took it to the next level and said hey maybe one of the ways that we can like curb abortion is by taking other people's fetuses and then implanting them in in people's wombs which a is that a thing but b like how does that play out what it's so wild. And like, I don't even know how it would play out. And it's it's just insane that the states decide that we, we don't have rights. 
that our primary usefulness in um, awake life and brain death is just whatever your womb is up to, right? And then when you take it and you like, you know, I think in Molly's steaming dump, she also talked about how this hospital in Colorado, abortion-friendly Colorado, has decided that if even if you're having a C-section because you're excavating a, a child out of your womb, you can't have a tubal ligation, which is basically permanent birth control because they've decided you can't. It's like, it doesn't matter. At no point, either in life or death, you can't decide when to stop having children. Yeah. And the cannibalization of public hospitals by Catholic hospitals, you know, is plays a giant role. This is Catholic Hospital, the Colorado one you're talking about. But also just occasionally we'll tell stories of some creep, whether it's Lauren Boebert creep, whether it's a man creep, referring to women as containers or vessels or, you know, all of that. It's just really true. And the fact that somebody can refer to themselves or got a degree and went to school and somebody else dubbed them an ethicist, it's like, you can't have your own set of facts. And like, I don't know, ethics works, but I feel like stealing someone's body, like some kind of fucking, I don't know, Matrix. Uh, aliens it, is the movie you're you're actually wanting to Aliens. Aliens is the yeah. movie you're referencing. Is kind of a mess. Me. I'm like, it's not the Matrix, it's Aliens. Aliens, <laughs> right? And so when you think like, how far are they going to go? The answer is, I don't know. But the fact that they've gone far enough to actually ponder taking people who are in a vegetative state and forcing them to gestate for the sake of who? Because in the story that you were talking about of the woman in Texas, A, this creepy guy named Matt Schaefer, who we'll put about him in the show notes because he's the legislator who really was pushing this issue. Her husband was like, I don't, we don't want, I don't want this for my wife. I do not want this. So what are we, what are they going to do? Like they're just just ate a baby. And then, then that person not only has, does that has a C-section. Is that what happens? You can labor in a vegetative state. So uh, probably yes. And who pays for that? Who pays for any of this? Who paid for the month that this woman was in, in intensive care, basically in care, right? Right. When her family didn't want her there. Who paid so, for you know, it's, I don't mean to make it about money, but like, bankrupting people for medical procedures against their will that are profoundly traumatizing, profoundly like just dishonoring the person's body, the person's bodily autonomy is what this pro-life party is all about. It's unbelievable. 1000%. We got more to talk about, Liz. Yeah, we do. Yeah. The brain dead is being spread around in Tennessee. Brain dead politicians are doing the most. Last week, we talked about how fake clinics are unregulated and potentially unsanitary. And apparently the Tennessee governor read the same article and said, hold my Jack and Coke. That is truth, Moji. So get this. In Tennessee, the governor, Bill Lee, I'm just going to start calling him Bill Lee, proposed this week, funneling a hundred million dollars of your taxes to fake clinics. This is the same state that turned down Medicaid expansion, free money from the government to expand Medicaid for folks who are low income, and also three weeks ago, cut millions of dollars in HIV prevention. Governor Lee also rejects any provisions in Tennessee's abortion laws, which currently have no exceptions for rape and incest. So he's like, nope, nope, and nope. But here, fake clinics have all the money. So Bill Lee, proving yet again that these anti-abortion politicians have a lot in common with the free diapers they give to pregnant people. They're both full of shit. Full of shit! Oh my God, Tennessee has such a history of shittiness. I feel like if you follow the money... (laughs) Yeah. You'll probably find something terrible. You know, they've been curbing laws. I mean, back in 2014, they sort of started this path where they wanted their state laws to uh, supersede federal laws so that they could ban abortion, even if the federal government said that they didn't and they passed that law and somehow they were doing that. But to literally turn down Medicaid expansion, free money from the federal government so that you could actually expend programs that help actual families. And then and say instead, oh, I was just looking under my couch and we found this cool hundred mil that we're going to put towards people who do not provide care. And this isn't the first go around with Tennessee giving money to fake clinics because last year they allocated a bunch of money to give ultrasound machines 
to these fake clinics. And the website of one of the places that they gave the ultrasound machines to has a disclaimer that says any information provided is, quote, an educational service and should not be relied on as a substitute for professional and or medical advice. You know what, Liz? That's probably the most true thing on their website. Yeah. But but you know what I don't want to be, again, experimented on for educational purposes when I'm looking for medical advice, when I want an actual ultrasound so that I can talk about my pregnancy options. And instead, they're using medical equipment as educational. But, you know, who's looking at that if you're a desperate person trying to find some affordable health care? No one. Basically, we all know that fake clinics rely on people either reading quickly or or not being able to see the information in front of them. They plan on it. They focus on it. They build their sites around being able to trick people. And then you show up and you get non-service. You get non-help. Also, if you're going to be a state and you're going to ban abortion, then maybe you put $100 million towards, I don't know, needy families. Raise the the minimum amount of money people can get in TANF, right? Like actually help people who have children. Or here's an idea. How about take $100 million and fund all options clinics so that somebody could walk in and hear all of their options that are available to them. And if they choose to parent and they need to get on programs, having good people like our guest who's coming up in a minute, the amazing Reverend Salisbury, to help them make the choices they need and help support them with the choices they make. Because Moji, funding pregnancy isn't helping you raise your family. And while we want everyone to have healthy pregnancies, if your pregnancy outcome doesn't allow you to have a healthy family and the resources to be healthy in where you live and how you feed your children and and stuff like that, then what is the, what are we doing? What are we doing? We're raising, you know what we're doing? We're creating healthy pregnancies for white people to adopt babies from these people, steal them from them. Thank you for keeping us in the dystopian horrorscape that we've been in. For but like, episode. I mean, don't you yeah. think that's what I that do. is? I do think that is. It's that or it's building a permanent underclass to do the bidding of these people. White people. Yes, that's right. And I just want to say too, like Tennessee, like just for if y'all haven't been like on the Tennessee train like we have, like I just want to fill you in on like some of the shenanigans like just from this year, right? So Tennessee passed one of the most draconian abortion bans, like no abortions anytime, anywhere in Tennessee. And then one of the people who's in their legislature who was like, oh, uh, I'm a doctor. I guess I should have read the bill and admitted he didn't, was like, maybe we need an amendment. Like maybe we should allow some exceptions. So these fuckers, the exception they came up with was, okay, we'll give you a rape exception. but. You have to prove you were raped, file a police report. And if we found out you were lying, you're going to go to jail. For three That's what, years. For three years. That was their exception. Also, uh, there was a brave woman who was miscarrying in Tennessee and was needing an abortion, could not get an abortion because the hospital was too afraid to help her. The hospital transported her six hours away to another state. She almost bled out because the draconian laws, if you provide abortion, are like a hundred thousand dollar fine, jail time, you lose your license as a doctor. This is this is your Tennessee. And then on top of it, not taking Medicaid expansion to help families, cutting HIV, not helping anybody. This is not, it's a mess. It's, it's a all whole a mess. mess. It's a whole mess. Yeah. Um, and so it's just like, I really just ponder constantly what it is that people do all day when trying to make someone's life worse. Like your dedication to that is just mind blowing. Well, the step one is not thinking about other people, basically, I think, or at least not as people. Or reducing, yeah, reducing people to chattel and just having that be that whatever bidding we're supposed to be doing for people, it's terrible. So, right, um, so- we're we'll put all that hole. information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have, let, yeah. we have, we have some good things coming up <laughs> yeah, on the yeah. show. But it does. This is like, uh, this is good. Yeah. But as a reminder, these stories will be in the show notes. And as always, we remind you the best, most up to the minute resource on accessing abortion care and funding for your care is I need an A.com. 
That's right. And, you know, we wanted to continue with the story and touch on a little bit more just about, you know, what organizations are doing to combat bazillions of dollars that are poured into these fake clinics when they're trying to do the good work of the people. So we have the perfect guest today to sort of take this conversation to the next level. Joining us is someone who works for a Tennessee-based reproductive justice group. And the founder of this group started it after her experience at a fake clinic. So I'm excited to welcome Reverend Dr. Elise Salisbury, Director of Programming at Sister Reach. Hello. Hi. We are so excited to have you here because we just, I don't think there can ever be enough conversations around reproductive justice, abortion, and how we deal with it from a faith-based perspective, right? So before we get into all that, I'd love for folks to learn a little bit about Sister Reach and let folks know a little bit too about what a reproductive justice organization looks like and what y'all focus on in your work. Awesome. So um, Sister Reach is a 501c3 grassroots uh, reproductive justice organization. We were founded in 2011 by Cherie Scott, our CEO and founder. Um, and so we advocate for the reproductive autonomy of women, teens of color, poor and rural women, LGBTQIA people, and their families through the framework, again, of reproductive justice. Our work includes empowering our base to lead healthy lives, raise healthy families, and live in healthy, safe, and sustainable communities. And we increase our, the awareness um, and impact our supporters by centering the voices experiences and leadership of those who are most vulnerable and most marginalized. And we do that through conversations with the community, trainings that we offer to enhance the um, knowledge of our base, uh, building among the people that we serve. And so we accomplish these using our four-pronged strategy of education, policy and advocacy, culture shift, and harm reduction work. And so as a state-based organization um, that works locally, uh, regionally, nationally, and of course, internationally. Prior to Sister Reach existence, there was no other uh, reproductive justice organization in the state of Tennessee. But since its founding and our work, there have been our partners and other organizations that have taken on the reproductive justice framework. Uh, they've adopted it, you know, and so because they realized that, that the, the reproductive justice framework is a great strategy. It's a great framework and the practice, right, that it espouses or the practices that it espouses uh, to achieve human rights. Uh, they choose it, right, to do the work for their base also. Um, at Sister Reach, we offer several programs that in which we serve the community. One that we're especially proud of. We're proud of all of them, but we're especially proud uh, Pearl's Pantry, where we get to serve food, clothes, shoes, uh, undergarments, all for free to the community. Um, what I love about the program is that uh, it does not limit the people that we serve, you know, so, uh, as it relates to like incomes, because in the moment that we're living through, regardless of income, people are existing through really challenging financial times. And so this program is our way of helping families on all income levels, basically, who need the program. Boy Talk and Womanish are our LGBT programs, which offer strong uh, policy focuses, being that we live in a state where uh, several anti-LGBTQIA policies uh, and other slate of hate bills are uh, being crafted, right? So uh, those programs is where are where we, we serve, right, the uh, LGBT community. And, and it's our way uh, of some, for myself, of lived experience, right? It's my way of being able to advocate for myself also. And so our faith work, we have that, uh, those programs uh, here at Sister Reach. It, it's a stellar program um, as we train, uh, that we use to train community leaders, clergy, other organizations, advocates, community members, right? Laity, regardless of, of who the individual is actually to how to be, we teach them how to be more inclusive and affirming uh, of all people from an interfaith perspective, including spirituality. Uh, we have the Interfaith Coalition for Human Rights, where clergy across the country, right, who uh, support our work and advocates for human rights, they do these uh, or they help us accomplish this work. Uh, through their ministries, which I think is pretty great. So um, one other program I like to mention is our You, you Me, 
HIV program that places emphasis on Black women, Black cisgender women, a community that's been severely neglected as it relates to uh, the focus of HIV, right? And so um, we offer HIV testing, free HIV testing, free hep C testing. Our harm reduction work includes syringe ex exchange program and our programming uh, that we call substance use intervention program. And so we do all of these things at Sister Reach to serve the community in the way uh, where, where we're able to serve the whole family, right? And so that's just a little bit about our work. And we're, we're really excited about the work that, that we have in motion here. So cool. I am super excited about all that. It's just like an all-encompassing reproductive justice. And I really love that you don't discriminate by income because I feel like income is such a tiny metric of like the resources that a person may have and may need. Yes, absolutely. Sister Reach was founded by a Black woman, uh, Cherie Scott, who survived a fake clinic visit while pursuing reproductive care. And we were just on the podcast talking about how the Tennessee governor has decided that he's going to give $100 million to these fake clinics. And alternatively, he refused funding for HIV prevention. Can you tell us how are you all navigating this and pivoting your work? Sure. So Sister Reach, like all of the other reproductive justice organizations, we weren't surprised about the overturning of Roe v. Wade. As a matter of fact, uh, many of our organizations had already begun in intentionally. We'd intentionally expanded our work or at least started expanding our work to deal with the aftermath of losing uh, abortion access in conservative states. Uh, we kind of knew what it would look like, right, as uh, women, women of color, and so and and how it would look to for our communities that would be impacted, right? So for Sister Reach, that includes us expanding our work to Chicago, which we did as early as last summer, so that in the event, right, we were not able to continue our work in Tennessee, we would at least be able to continue functioning to serve pregnant people in need of abortion care out of Illinois. And so that work at its beginning stages, uh, because as organizers, we're not coming into an area just beginning work, right? Uh, but making sure that we're just as much of an asset to the Black families and Chicagoland area uh, as we are trying to be uh, with the folks in the Southeast seeking abortion care and gender affirming care, right? In areas like Illinois. And so we anticipate it and we anticipate, right? Criminalization of even those uh, leaving the state to get abortion care and advocates who attempt to help them. And these are other reasons we expanded our work also. And so just in case we have to close shop, we can still function. So one of the ways that we pivoted our work right, was to relocate or to expand our work into Illinois. And so uh, regarding our HIV work, we never depended on the government to supplement our work because the government's focus was never Black women, right? And so really it was never here, especially in our state, it was never for LGBT people, right? That wasn't the focus of the state specifically. So one of the ways we are able to do free HIV testing, comprehensive reproductive and sexual health education, uh, including prevention and intervention was by seeking out funding from private foundations and partnering with local trusted medical providers like Choices, Spirit Health, and our um, statewide, I'll say, Planned Parenthood. And so because these entities in many ways uh, depended, because they depended on the government to supplement their care, and that includes, right, a free contraception. This caused a barrier for Sister Reach, who, for example, have been partnering with Planned Parenthood for our internal and external condoms, dental dams, and lube, so we could offer these uh, resources to not just those that reside within the state of Tennessee, but it's part of our national distribution program. And so what this does mean, actually, that we will have to seek out additional funding for barrier methods, but it does not totally derail our work, right, as it relates to sex health uh, distribution products or products distribution. It's important that the same energy, though, one of, one of the things that I'm really adamant about when I show up in spaces is ensuring that the reproductive rights community places the same emphasis on other issues that impact us as great of an impact as abortion, right? Uh, that the same energy uh, is put on those issues uh, as it relates to access to contraception, 
including emergency com- contraception, so that organizations like Sister Reed can continue this important work. So one other thing, we are also now going to have to pay for HIV tests which are very expensive uh, because the state will not provide them to programs that depend on them for uh, access to those free tests. Uh, So we'll have to pay them, you know, and uh, again, financially it's expensive as over the last two years due to COVID, we've spent almost $400,000 on our safe sex kit program alone. That does not include the capacity that we Uh, used to do that work. So though we were being uh, supplemented for some HIV tests, we still never really had enough tests and um, those are extremely expensive. So that's how we've been able to pivot in our work with the way that um, the state is working to uh, not distribute to the organizations on the ground these uh, funds that we need to do our work. You touched on something, you know, about reproductive rights organizations really looking broader and looking outward. And and I and I think that that's so important because what we always say on this podcast is the reproductive justice lens in its most basic form is that you value all pregnancy outcomes and want to pr- b- promote healthy families, you know, in the in the simplest of ways that we could possibly say it to somebody just learning. And, you know, as we travel around the country and we and we go visit and service the the independent providers who are expanding from abortion care to trans care, gender affirming care, everything that you talked about outside of those clinics, we see a very different faith. I'm quoting, I have air quotes for those of you listening, (laughs) faith based white evangelical, because I really think it's white evangelical, uh, which feels like oppression. And, you know, for you to be using faith to really center why reproductive justice is part of faith. I think a lot of folks need to hear from you how they can frame, you know, their decision to have abortions when we escort people in. And it's a lot of young black kids who grew up in in black church. It's a lot of white kids who grew up in white evangelical church and all talk about the fear they have of their salvation as people are screaming at them that their salvation will be challenged. Can you just give a little bit of hope and a little bit of framing for folks listening who might really need to hear from a pure, lovely soul like yourself to talk to them and tell them they're okay. Absolutely. So one of the interesting things I've learned as a pastor, that a lot of the theology, right, that many of the clergy leaders that preach against abortion, let's just say, right, they're not teaching the, they're they're not teaching all of what they know. They're not teaching all of the scripture. And so one of the things that I offer is Numbers 5 in the King James Version, where there is, this is a text that talks about a priest. It is the law of Moses, right, that gives access to a priest to perform an herbal abortion, right? Sharice and I, we go into these spaces and we talk about this text, and most of the people have never heard about it. And so, again, it is the intentional, errant theology preaching that many of uh, the clergy folks who offer condemnation, let's just say, right, as it relates to abortion, it's errant, it's wrong, it's not God, it's anti-God, actually, to cause folks to feel like they're a decision that they are making right, is one that is wrong. And so what what I would admonish even clergy who may be listening, right, to consider uh, what we learned in seminary and to offer grace and mercy and support and love to the folks who need it. Because the truth of the matter is when it comes to having to make the choice, right, to reach for a provider for an abortion, there is something Right. There's something within that individual's lived experience that pushes them, forces them to have to make this choice, I'll say. And so I want us to to start to consider more than just the decision, which isn't our decision. Right. It is the individual's decision or that individual and their partner, however that works for that individual. It is their decision. Right. To make it. And so I want to say also to those who have to make the choice. Right. So there's no condemnation in the decision that you're having to make. You know, it's one that I believe 
that is one that is based on not not only circumstances that are that um surround the decision, but it is free will, right? It is free will. It's allowing people to make decisions that will be beneficial for their own lives, regardless of the why. And so again, those who have to make the decision, my prayers um, as a person who prays, my meditations, my thoughts are with you, you know, and, and I know what the after effect can be, right? You know, the thoughts that come afterward, but even in those, right? There is grace for you. Uh, it, it is a decision that I believe based on what I read that God absolutely supports. I love that. It's Thank so you for that. Here. So Sister Reach has uh, Black Folks Day on the Hill coming up. Yes. <laughs> Can you tell our audience a little bit more about this event and how those of us not even in Tennessee can support? Sure. So Black Folks Day on the Hill is an event that we do here at Sister Reach. It is February 21st. The event is 930 to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. And what the event is, is a day where we speak with legislators face to face to discuss bills sponsored and how those bills will impact the community, the good and the bad. And so this gives constituents planned times, right? We have normally have like 30 minute increments that will pull bills that they'll sponsor. And we take our time and ask them questions and we offer them input about how that bill would impact us. Again, this is both on the positive and bills that would negatively impact the community. And so we offer this time to the community because many people desire to speak with their legislators, but they aren't given, they don't know how, right? They don't know how to contact. They don't know where. And so even before we have the actual Black Folks Down the Hill event, what we do is uh, we plan two info sessions where we teach the community how to do this. You you can go to Nashville if you desire. You can go and talk face-to-face with your local uh, governments if you desire. And so this event specifically, Black Folks Down the Hill, is an event, again, uh, pre-COVID, right? We were going and we were sitting down across the desk face-to-face, but because we know that COVID impacted our community, it was devastating, right, the impact that it had on communities of color. And so we want to act responsibly right, and protect the lives that we serve. And so uh, we're doing it virtually this year. And so we invite folks to use the link to register. We will receive access on the dates and times, again, of the info sessions where you'll learn how to pull bills, right, uh, things that impact you or look at a certain legislator's bills that, that they have sponsored and look at the details of what these people that we are voting for, you know, the impact of that their work directly makes on you as an individual, on our community and across the state. So it's a really great event that we're really hope that folks show up for, you know, because we are we are in Tennessee again. And so we are facing another slew of slate of hate bills. And so, yes, uh, please join us. Please, please, please join us. Again, using the link to register, and you'll receive further information by email. I love the term slate of hate. That's great. It really it really <laughs> sums it up. I think we need to incorporate that into what we say. I also love this because when people find out about how to engage, it helps increase voter turnout, Absolutely. right? When you know, then you care. Absolutely. So thank you so much. And we're going to have the links to that in our show notes. And I want to add, so there are thousands, right, of bills that have been sponsored, right, this year. And so by investing in those info sessions, it it also teaches people how to go to the site and look to read the bills for themselves, right? Because there's there's no way we could pull and center every bill, but we do try to center those that most greatly impact our community. So I just wanted to add that, that people do have the ability to go and search out these things. But specifically in this event, we don't mind taking our time to stop in and center the bills that most impact the folks across the state of Tennessee. Thank you so much. Thank you both for the invitation. We at Sister Reach absolutely appreciate you and the work that you do. Well, we love it too. And and for those of you who are uh, listening, they are taking over our Instagram and you can find out about all the work they're doing uh, this Monday. Just follow our Instagram And they're going to let you know exactly what you should be knowing about all of their work. 
Sister Reach's virtual Black Folks Day on the Hill is on February 21st from 9.30 to 4 p.m. Central Time. You can sign up for this event and all of their other virtual events through the link in our show notes. And keep up with Sister Reach's work on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Sister Reach Everywhere. Now it's time for the game show that we insist is sweeping the potosphere, but I do not know. But I'm going to keep insisting. Six degrees of abortion. It's a simple game. Moji has chosen a story from the news this week unrelated to abortion or presumably reproductive health. And I have six choices, six guesses, if you will, to tie it back to abortion. Moji, how are you trying to stump me this week? I'm actually really proud of myself. And as I'm rereading the six degrees that my other co-host Marie and I chose together, it's in Tennessee also. Uh, We can't get out of this fucking place. We are literally stuck in Tennessee (laughs) this week. So this is a Grammy thing. The Tennessee State University Marching Band won its first Grammy for a song that they wrote called The Urban Hymnal. And they won the award for Best Roots Gospel Album. So this is pretty exciting. And again, when we chose this, we did not even know or notice that we were going to be stuck in Tennessee all episode. Our question is, one of the producers of this was Dallas Austin. You may know of him. He uh, produced also for uh, TLC and Boyz II Men. And we would like you to link Dallas Austin to abortion. Well... If Dallas Austin produced TLC, TLC is a delightful rap combo. TLC, I hosted a radio show with Chuck D, who is also a delightful rapper, and I love abortion. So TLC to Chuck D to me. And I'm kind of bummed, Moji, from a very narcissistic standpoint that you didn't say tie the Grammys to abortion. So I could have said Trevor Noah hosted the Grammys. Trevor Noah hosted The Daily Show. I co-created The Daily Show that I am on on Monday. So that I did it twice. Good. We were like, Grammys is too too broad. Grammys is oh, too, too broad. broad. <laughs> yeah, you could just be like, yeah. uh, basically, you could just say. One of them horse had an abortion. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> exactly. I'm like, uh, all of those people had abortions. Oh, abortions. <laughs> they should be called the abortos. The abortos. You know, no, no. Come Grammys on. was too broad. And I was like. No, but that was good. I, th- I thought it was a fun one. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. So I'm proud of us. Also, I will accept that. Well done. Although. TLC- I could have also said that, Sh- that Sharon, Paul, and I did a karaoke duet of Waterfalls. <laughs> drunk at one of and our of abortion, abortion access front holiday parties <laughs> so i could have said that so i got a lot of ways to go with that one and i just really just tried to like that was like some crazy like you know when people play trivial pursuit and then they don't know the right answer so they have to say something that they do know that's not so they can prove they know stuff yes. i feel like i just did that I think drop some knowledge. I'm, All right. I'm here well, for it. that was great. That was great. Okay. Very good. Well, you know, let's, uh, we got to move on. But before we do, Moji, uh, there, we have some housekeeping, as the kids say in the business. We do. We really just couldn't bring you today's episode of Feminist Buzz Kills Live without our wonderful fake sponsor, Organizer, the first daily ordeal delivery service. That's right. We have to comb through so much bullshit for this podcast. Sometimes it's hard to remember who's calling us a useless slut, who's telling us to make them a sandwich. It's so nice to get all the patriarchal hate and oppression delivered right into your inbox. That's why I subscribe to Organizer. Same here. Last week, instead of spending four hours on Twitter, I opened up my Organizer inbox and bam, all the comments calling me a baby killer or a skank or a skanky baby killer, just all in one place. How convenient. When I opened up my organizer inbox this week, it was a handy alphabetized list of incels and anti-abortion enthusiasts and their different plans to push abortion advocates and anyone who wouldn't fuck them out the door. Thanks, organizer. Sign up for organizer today with promo code poor buzz kill and get 50% off your ability to function in this society as anyone but a cishet white male. Organizer, if it's going to happen anyway, it might as well be in one place. You know, that actually should be a product. <laughs> Listen, it saves time. Listen, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I could get all of my threats just in one thing, one just like sent place. to me, I oh. feel like somebody's, some tech person 
is miss is missing an opportunity to be helpful and also make a killing. You know what? They're having layoffs now. Some tech person do this in your downtime. Yeah, there you go. You're welcome. Hot tip for somebody who wants to make a cool meal. Just tell them we sent you. All right. Anyway, you ready for our guest? I'm excited yeah. for our next guest. Uh, now, you may know her from rap, acting, comedy, production, or her non-denominational church or something totally different. Her album of daily affirmations called You Got This Shit is a hilarious must listen. And look for her memoir in my remaining years on a bookshelf near you as soon as she finishes it. Please welcome multi-potentialite, creative genius, the one and only Jean Grey. Hey, Jean. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Jean. Hey, welcome. Hello. Hello. Thank you. So when we were setting up this interview, we noticed that you are all in, in your series of superior titles, right? Oh, (laughs) so good. (laughs) Oh, thank you. Could you do a little summary of your titles for us? Oh my, titles of what? Oh my gosh. We have multi-potentiate is my favorite. Polymath, multi-hyphenate. Yeah. Autodidact. Autodidact. creative genius you know we've already gone through most Mm -hmm. of them already so like (laughs) that's it so how do you get the most out of yourself while doing all of this what do you have to Marie Kondo out of your life to just make space for this I very uh recently had to learn that you know the easiest thing to do is to stack all of your um your passions and your career so so like one thing leads to another thing so they all uh, live under one house but the reason that I have to use all of those descriptors is mainly men it, because it's never enough to like, just say like my, my answer is usually they're like, well, so what do you do? And I'm like, it's a terrifying question for a multi-potentialite. So I always say um, like, what do you, what I do, whatever needs to get done. Uh, and they don't understand what that means. So I've just added many things to it. So I'm talking for a long amount of time and then hopefully they walk away. If you're lucky. <laughs> if, yeah. If yeah. you're lucky. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm also like uh, fingering a knife while I'm doing that. So that helps if you're in person. <laughs> Man, the root of all evil. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> you got a lot there going scourge. on. There's scourge. There's scourge. You know, also, it just, I think that just fingering a knife, getting that down yeah. is good. I mean, I it's good. a skill we should all cultivate. Maybe even fingering. Fingering, just fingering. <laughs> I'm also I've picked up my uh, the first uh, weapons training that I wanted to do this year. So I've started uh, uh, bow staff training. So I'm very excited to move on, like master that and then move on to the next one. It's a long life. You can do whatever you want. You should be able to like if there's a bar fight breaks out, you grab like the, the pool cue off the wall and you go to fucking town. That's- that was fully my question. I was like, how do you walk around with a bow staff? But you're right. They're bow staff. Stand-ins yeah. well, they all have over the, the little, place. Yeah, they're stand-ins, and then they have that little, uh, you can get it on Amazon. It, it's like a, t- a little uh, magic stick, and then you press it, and then both sides kind of flip out like a Darth Maul, and I'm very much into that. So I don't want to add to your already exhaustive plate that we're going to talk about, but since you've said that, now mm. Roadhouse remake starring Jean Grey. Oh, I'm into it. Bring it. Oh, give, yes. me, give, me, give me two years. <laughs> okay. Because I really wanted to see, you know, bar fights, weaponizing, all of it. Yes. But without the misogyny and the rapey scenes. Right. But also, I'm going to just do a hot thing here because your lady detective, you could combine that because let's, can we just talk about your, let's just talk about the Patreon show first, because I like a detective series (laughs) starring Jean Grey. Everyone should like a detective series. Talk about your detective series. It's, it's uh, available on Patreon. People need to get on Patreon and get it. Yeah, Stacey Jambles um, started off. Uh, there was a, a, a show that a band asked me to do, and they were like, we're just going to jam out, and then we want you to come and freestyle. I was like, one, no. Uh, <laughs> two, I, that sounds, I fucking hate that. I I never, ever want that to be the situation that happens. Um, so what I did instead was to write a 20-minute interactive uh <laughs> detective noir and so and had them be the band for it so they had no idea what was happening and i was sort of like and then jazz played <laughs> the audience came to see a rap show i was like you shouldn't have done that 
Um, and the band didn't know what was <laughs> happening. And then I sort of took uh, Stacey Jamble uh, for the next couple of years on the Joko cruise and it became a great like interactive show that we would do. Uh, she's basically, it's done in the detective noir style of the 1940s. One, I've never seen uh, a woman or a non-binary or a queer person or a black person be a detective ever. And also, you know, probably she would have gotten killed if she was doing those things. Uh, but she also has short-term memory. So uh, Stacy tries her very best to solve these cases. It's a little difficult when you forget what the case is, where you are, who you are. <laughs> but I think the great thing is that, you know, being black and queer and in, in the 1940s, you're like, is she a detective? <laughs> what? And the idea that you can forget yourself and you can be anything you want. And the other great part of Stacey Jambles is that I love things that are throwback, things that are nostalgia, but I think if we're going to embrace it, we embrace all of it. So the commercials and the breaks of Stacey Jambles are for things like, you know, black children is gator bait or a <laughs> menstrual pad that hooks up to a muzzle. If we're going to do something that's in the time, embrace the whole fucking thing. Mm -hmm. Get products that people would use. It's true. <laughs> yeah. We have fake commercials on our show too because we can't get sponsors. So we have we have products like Air Jordan Petersons. Yeah. <laughs> Some real crazy shit. <laughs> it's like, yeah, because uh I think I think that is key yeah. to all of it. And oftentimes more often than not and this is why i love you because i feel like you're one of the best satirists out there always have been thank you when we did the golden probes and you were our host the golden probes is an award show mm -hmm. celebrating the worst of misogynists and white supremacy in politics particularly you did a throwback fuck Lynn manuel miranda style opening number that was so great and you were like i'm just gonna do this i think the greatest part the, the thing that i enjoy most and it doesn't like matter what form of art it is that i like to uh provide a false a false sense of security for the audience nice. <laughs> and be like this is and they're like i am really into this and i'd be like are you really into it well this comes along with all of that so, yeah you're never safe, people. No, You're no. never safe. <laughs> but I think, too, that's why I love your affirmations. I was on a plane yesterday and I downloaded and I was listening to them. And it was just like, it's the friend who, who actually you really wish you had who would actually tell you shit that's really true rather yeah. than false sense of your own. Like, if I just say these things, that's really going to get me to that place. It's like. You're just not cutting any shit with them, but they're great. Yeah. And and I th I think, you know, the other kind of affirmations and meditations are really good, too. Sometimes I want some like really positive, powerful shit. And I put on, you know, like the walking meditations. And by the time I get like 20 minutes and I'm like, hell, fuck, yeah, I'm going to take over the goddamn world. And I definitely tried to do something like that. I'm like, this is just not who I am. I'm I'm positive about everything. Um, being uh, very realistic. I think being able to look at everything and be like, some things are shitty and some things are great. And the thing that we can control is, you know, ourselves. There's never going to be stability outside. We're the stability. And that comes along with like embracing all, all of the bullshit. I've been blasting the affirmations in my house uh, and they're terrifying my partner. So I oh, think no. that they're working. <laughs> no, they're great. <laughs> which, which one? Oh, I've been playing all of them. Played the whole thing. You know, I've, I just played them. You fucking got this shit. <laughs> and he's like, what is, what is happening? And I was like, I'm playing affirmation, dear. <laughs> and it's working. Maybe it's not for you. Yeah, I wasn't going to put any music on there, but um, something like wear that thing as I'm sort of moving into understanding so much more of design and fashion and really has become a big part of my life. How important that is to do, to step out into the world authentically like just not caring just yeah. don't care don't care or or care that was the first one i heard and i was like walking on the upper west side and it just came on in my headphones and i was like this feels right i want to stomp the street i mm -hmm. want to feel when renaissance came out pure the the song pure honey and it's such like a, a ballroom room down and dirty and i i vogue so hard in the street that, but I had just put hand sanitizer on and I flung the hand sanitizer so hard that it went around my glasses, got in my eye and just, 
I still tried to keep Vogue and I was like, no, I'm, I'm being powerful in the street, but like screaming <laughs> my eyes, you my eyes. yourself to tears. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Beyonce. I really <laughs> needed that today. That was an affirmation for me. Well, we actually had thought about this because you are an expert in affirmations and we are loving the affirmations. We were wondering if you could come up with some spontaneous affirmations if we give you uh, some situations. Do you have your affirmation, yes. Adeline? Yes. All right, cool, cool. So this is great. So one of them, you're dating a dude. If no. that's what you do. Uh, <laughs> you're dating no. a person. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> the best sex of your life. All right, all right. Uh, no, okay. no. Yeah, yeah. Gene, and okay, they let you it. know they have tickets to see Jordan Peterson. What is the affirmation to just get away from this person and ignore the bullshit? Like, what is the you deserve better affirmation that we need to share with anyone who might find themselves in this terrible situation? I think there's a lot of times where you have to not even look at the other person and say, what the fuck is wrong with you? Because at that point, you are already that far into dating. There had to be some sort of flags that would <laughs> alert you that this was the kind of person. So you need to go to whatever mirror is in, any, even if it's a piece of aluminum foil, anything you could slightly see yourself in and ask yourself, what the fuck is wrong with me? <laughs> what, is, what is it that I need to do in order to be able to see people? Because I'm clearly doing a terrible job. Take a look at that tinfoil hat. And something. <laughs> I think that's absolutely right. I think that is absolutely correct. Yeah. What the fuck is wrong with me? Why am I, why did I get this? Yeah. Why did I get this far? Why am I in my pants? How, how did I, how did we get here? How did I get here? The fuck happened to my standards is the question. You, yeah. You, you were ignoring something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to get, I'm just going to play word association and you're going to give an affirmation or help this person through it. Okay. <laughs> George Santos. Um, drag race season 16. Just think about it. <laughs> like the makeup needed a bit of work, but I liked where it was going. It like was effort. Steps. Lean, lean into the competition of it. <laughs> that seems good. Trying to think who else would be a good person who might need some affirmations right now. I, and I just, I also just wanted to say, it's like white scammers are just what it's it's fucking fascinating there's yeah. nothing in me maybe that's the affirmation i hate the standard of like do anything you want to do always be like you know have the mediocrity of like a white dude i, I think that's it's not useful because you shouldn't aspire to be the the standard of a white dude for anything i don't i don't care what it is mm. i think it's the commitment like i there's nothing in me that would be like, I could definitely do that scam. But I think I have the freedom of being like, hey, man, I could start a cult. Yeah, I've, start, I've started a cult. Maybe maybe think about that freedom. So not that he's like scamming and doing all that terrible shit or, or you know, Anna Delvey, but the commitment to freedom is a positive I like it. point from there. And Gene, how are you dealing in these days where realities just don't matter anymore? You know, and that's the thing that I think is the biggest struggle that a lot of people have. And you mm. have good advice about everything. So I want to know what you would say to somebody about like, there's people just walking around saying, you know, crazy shit that isn't true. I had a very long conversation with someone that I thought I knew better than to ask me. Like we had a long conversation about like what reality was. And I was like, are you are you questioning and saying like being, being like, it's okay for everyone to have their own reality. I'm like, no, that's, that's how we're here. Like in, in this problem, this is when people are like, yeah, well, you know, your opinion is your opinion and that's your reality. I'm like, no, honey, see, there's one, there's one, we can have our feelings. We can have facts, but facts are not feelings and everyone can't have separate realities. And I wish that that was a course that was taught to very young children. So if anyone knows any schools that will let me come in and corral their children in dark corners and just scream that we need to have one reality at them. I love it. If you're listening, let me into your schools. It would be helpful. This is the freedom and commitment that I'm talking about. Yeah, this is Or, good. you know, parents teach your, your kids about that. That'd probably be more helpful. I just can't believe how much you're doing. And it's all so cool, you know, between the detective series and the affirmations and 
you're writing a memoir. Where are you at in the process? And like, just don't ask someone who's, you know, better than to ask someone who's writing a book where the <laughs> fuck they are and writing a book, Liz. That's some fucked up shit. It's true. That fuck is out very of here, true. Liz. It's so funny because it was like, I don't know if she's just like signed a book. Because I got a book deal and it was supposed to be delivered in 18 months. And at 17 months, I was like, hey, it, what, did you say I was supposed to start this book in 18? I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought you said I was supposed to start the book <laughs> and now I haven't. Yeah. Can I get an extension? Because imposter syndrome is fucking real. And so I was I was going to ask you, A, if you're experiencing it and if you are experiencing it, where on the scale between zero and 10, zero being I'm so healthy that it's really just threatening and, and 10 being I have so much imposter syndrome that I'm I'm doing 17,000 other things to avoid writing my <laughs> memoir. I think when I when I started writing it and like not knowing how what my voice was going to do in this way or uh and I think I had a, a different way of thinking about it and um every you know especially as black people and people of color um we always think that when we get like a shot that that's the one shot to do everything. For everyone, for all of the people who look like us. For everyone, this is it. Ever. This, this one fucking project. And I had to let go of that real fast because it's not possible. It's not healthy. It just, we got to stop doing that. It's it's a difficult thing to let go of, but it was definitely really freeing. So I'd say I'm about a very incredibly healthy, like two. Great. On this particular career. And this portion, I, I know where it is. I know what I want to do. I would have been able to knock it out quicker. It's just that my life in the past like year did a lot of twists and turns. And I do not have the same life that I had two years ago. So when I went into writing the book, I was like, yeah, what? I'm going to just, I'm going to sit here and that's all I'm going to do. All I'm going to do is write this book that no life happens, mm -hmm. but Yes, I did. So I didn't think I would have an extension, but the extension uh, seems to be working for me. And I'm very hard on myself about deadlines, but good. I'm I'm having, I'm actually having a fucking good time writing. That's really wow. impressive because so many people say that they aren't enjoying the process. Are you choosing a part of your life or are you covering piece, like kind of a whole, a totality? I don't think um, memoirs in that general sense would work for me. I think I probably, yeah, no. Fingering that knife that I had earlier and then just, just jabbing it in repeatedly if I had chosen that. This is much more of a, uh, I described it as a, a coming of middle age because um, <laughs> I think we come of age many, many times in our life. Mm -hmm. and I, I just don't think this one is discussed in the way that I, many of us need it to be. And kind of that happening and me really finding those feelings during uh, like quarantine and, and lockdown and sort of, you know, I think all of us were really being faced with ourselves, but like faced with that and and faced with like <laughs> hitting this age and being like, oh, shit, no, this I don't want to be in here for this with just with me. Um, and so it, a lot of my life and my mom had me when she was, uh, 41. So, uh, growing up and a lot of references to her and, uh, how she looked at, at middle age and things that I've learned and then learned about myself. So much better, much, much easier than being like memoirs, tell all I'll do that. And then I will unalive myself like Dorothy Dandridge, that's how you'll find me. I'll tell all when most of the other people are dead. Yeah, I feel like that's probably uh, wise. You know, the thing about my mom was also 41 when she had me. Oh, really? There's a special joy of coming into puberty while they're going into menopause. And yes. there is just this emotional shit storm happening yeah. in your house that is next level that only certain people can understand that. It's really interesting because I think always being told also that traditionally, like there are certain ages to do things. And I'm like, well, I always thought when I turned like 45, that's like when you're an adult, like a real adult, not in your 30s, not in your 20s, not anything else, because that's like your 40s and your 50s. That's kind of when shit begins and everything before that. You're like, mm -hmm. and then um, and then you grow up and you're like, oh, yeah, no, that makes sense. 
So what's your biggest joy point? Like, what do you do to just like, uh, you're just like in your bliss? Any Anything that's uh, involving fashion. I just started my uh, online st- uh, store that's a lot of like curated secondhand luxury stuff and vintage things. My mom always wanted to open a store, so I named it after her. But anything that's um, delving into interior design, um, fabrics, fashion, getting dressed, learning, just learning about it, like, or building uh, visual boards, working on the new place I'm in, surrounding myself with fineries. I like to be surrounded by fineries and friends. And I think this year I also decided that that was part of the fineries, that it wasn't just the work and it's not just all of these like material things and that's all great, but connections I've, I'm taking a lot more seriously. Jean, thank you so much for joining us. I feel like we keep talking and talking and talking and I'm like, we are over our time. We gotta go. We gotta go. Get out of here. So thank you so much for giving us your time and talking about finery and affirmations. And we are excited about your memoir and when you write it, hopefully you'll come in and talk to us about it. I will. And I'll be at an imposter syndrome level 11. Lovely. (laughs) It'll be more relatable. (laughs) Yeah. You will have happy company here. (laughs) I'll leave you with this. Don't aim to be relatable. Absolutely not. You know who's not fucking relatable? Grace Jones. Aim to be aspirational. Fuck being relatable. (laughs) Oh, I love it. (laughs) Everyone, Jean Gray. Thank you for joining us, Jean. Thanks, Jean. Thank you, Jean. You can follow Jean Gray on Instagram, Jeannie Grigio. And you can subscribe to Jean's Patreon, patreon.com slash Jean Gray. And all that's in the show notes. Uh, Liz, that's our show. That is our show. It was a good one. Yeah. We miss you, Marie. It was sad without Marie. But thank you to Reverend Dr. Elise Salisbury for joining us today and for the IG takeover that's going to happen on Monday. And thank you so much for listening. We love you. We are here as you navigate these dark days. We want to be a reliable info hub and a source of humor as we face some really hard times. We're in this together. We got you. So if you got us, subscribe, write a review, give us five stars. It's the best way for our podcast to reach more people. And by doing so, you're helping more folks learn about this assault on abortion access. To keep up with all the latest repro news, follow us on social media at Abortion Front on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube. FBK Live is edited by Remy DeTournay and is produced by Abortion Access Front. Looking for where you might fit in to do some abortion activism? Look no further than our five-part training series, Operation Save Abortion, available in video and podcast form. Gather friends, watch or listen together and follow the activity guide for a full experience. Details on the series are at operationsaveabortion.com. Looking for some action, like be part of the solution action? Check out our activist calendar and see if there are opportunities to get involved with other state-level legislative advocacy. The calendar has it at operationsaveabortion.com. In the coming weeks, we've got opportunities to get involved in Massachusetts, Idaho, Illinois, New York, Georgia, Tennessee, Minnesota, and more. Check it out, operationsaveabortion.com. And in case you're just tuning in, everybody, Liz is going to be on The Daily Show on Monday. It's true. February 13th at 11 o'clock Eastern time, 10 p.m. Central. Check it out. Cheer us on. And then maybe send us some um, notes about how great she was. Or some do me. Or you can send us some money. Always, we always encourage that. And if you're in Los Angeles, do you know what we love to see? A bunch of cishet dudes using all that extra time they have not fearing for their reproductive rights to show up and raise money for abortion. That's right. Helen Hong is hosting a lineup of the funniest white dudes we know in L.A. Thursday, February 23rd. Get your tickets for Bro v. Wade at the Lodge Room in Highland Park. Tickets at aafront.org slash Bro v. Wade. That's right. A comedy show that's all white dudes on purpose raising money for abortion. What? Next week, we will be joined by Udawak Nakenga of the AFIA Center to talk about reproductive justice advocacy in Texas and Abortion AF OG and board member comedian Joyelle Nicole Johnson joins us. We have the best Black History Month show going. It's really next level. And lastly, join our Patreon. 
You'll support great content and get exclusive FBK merch and experiences. All the pledges support this pod and all of our activism at Abortion Access Front. If you want to join the Patreon or become a patron or a buzz kill tricks, as I like to say, <laughs> go to patreon.com slash feminist buzzkills. And we leave you with Christian hate preacher Jonathan Shelley, a man who's out here showing his whole ass by asking fellas, is it gay to ask your wife's opinion on what she does? With her vagina. I heard an independent fellow about his preacher. He's like, you know, it's not right for me to, to to just tell my wife when we're gonna have kids. You know, I need to ask her permission or ask when it's okay to start having kids. Wow. And I'm like thinking, like, are, are you a man? Yeah. Are you a Baptist? Yeah. You're a fundamental Baptist preacher, and you're gonna ask your wife if it's okay to have children? Yeah. I'm like, what planet am I living on? You know, how, how effeminate is that yeah. to let your wife tell you when she's going to have kids or not? Feminist Buzzkills Live, the podcast from Abortion Access Front. When BS is popping, we pop off. New episodes drop Friday. If you want to support our podcast and all the work of Abortion Access Front, like, subscribe, and join our Patreon at patreon.com slash feminist buzzkills.